Okay. And I do, and I do have a PowerPoint file as well. Um, I'm Molly John, as Mary said. Um, I am a professor in agronomy and in the laboratory of genetics at the University of Wisconsin. I also had the privilege of ser serving as dean of the College of Agriculture there, and um, and was called to Washington to fill in um, as acting undersecretary and deputy undersecretary in the research, education, and economics mission area, which is the mission area that um, guides the research investments at USDA. So I want to um, offer both my personal and and sort of institutional thanks to Mary and her colleagues at NIFA because the commitment that NIFA has brought forward to this community, um, which isn't only about delivering the dollars, but the structuring the programs and events like this is a very powerful catalyst to the development of this community. So I'm sure we all uh, join each other in thanking our colleagues at USDA for the investments, the important investments they've made. That said, if I could have the first slide, um, I am ordinarily, I'm pretty good at following directions, but I began to get this avalanche of fabulous abstracts about participatory plant breeding that's going on, and much of it is, is reasonably new, and most of it is funded by NIFA. Um, I don't know if, if we don't have slides, I can go, I can take as long as we want. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and, and so I have actually not elected to try to summarize the fabulous work. It is really now a very sizable body of work. There are fabulous posters here, and, um, and I really commend to you those posters. What I'm going to do is tell you about my own relationship with this subject, and not only, as Mary cited, the productivity um, and the kind of delivery of items that are valued, but much more significant, I think, as it has turned out, is the um, creation of a different kind of community, new values delivered into the research community, and, um, and I think a new respect for um, what the systems thinking and the holistic framing of the organic community means to researchers trained largely in a reductionist paradigm like me. I have a critical partner in this work, Jim Myers, who will be standing in for me um, in the panel discussion because, unfortunately, I need to excuse myself. Um, it's not that easy to get back to the heartland <laughs> um, on the same day. I also need to make a special acknowledgment in the audience. Um, Sarah Johnston is here. She currently works for the New York Department of Ag. Sarah, will you stand up? Because without Sarah, nothing I'm telling you would have happened. <laughs> Sarah was a very important part of my engagement in the organic community, and, um, and if we can get the slides, I will tell you the story that really began with a conversation that Sarah and I had. Um, and I'll just tell you that story, because I can do that without slides. <laughs> and it's an important story about, um, about how research communities can um, bridge the distance and open the um, interactions with the organic community. Um, I received a call for proposals, and actually I wasn't thinking about organic agriculture in particular. What I was thinking about in the Northeast was underserved agricultural communities. Now, in the land-grant system, we hold certain, and, and many other kinds of, of institutions, Perfect. We hold certain kinds of commitments to service and to the delivery of best information into real questions real people ask. I also bring an orientation towards ensuring that those who are not well served by existing especially commercial mechanisms deserve a special um, awareness on our part, given our public support. So I contacted Sarah and I said, um, what about working with the organic community? I'm, an orga I'm a vegetable breeder. We have lots of germplasm. We've had some good success moving germplasm out into varieties. What about working um, with the organic community? And there was a sort of pause on the other end, and she said, um, let me send you a couple of newsletters. Do you remember this? <laughs> Let me send you a couple of newsletters, and then um, and you look at those, and then you see if you really want to do this. And I thought, okay. So I got this packet from her, two newsletters folded open to articles about Cornell. Neither one of them had to do with vegetables. Neither one of them had to do with me. I didn't get it at all. They were articles about how frustrated the organic agriculture community has been with Cornell University through the 1990s. But I just didn't get it. <laughs> so I called Sarah back and I said, Sarah, are you, you want to collaborate on this grant? She said, did you get the newsletters? And I said, yeah. And she said, do you still want to collaborate? And I said, yeah. 
And what you see now came out of that conversation. It was only a year, a year and a half later that I figured out what I was really supposed to have figured out. As a consequence, um, we were drawn into a very different way of getting our work started. And this was um, a, a, a possibly uncharacteristic expression of humility in the land-grant system, recognizing that I knew nothing about farming organically, but I knew a lot about plant breeding. What I knew about plant breeding is your selection environment is critical. And I didn't have any organically managed ground in the late 1990s at Cornell University. So I figured we'd do what we've done all through the history of the land grant system and connect with produ producers. What I'm going to describe to you is one of the largest, possibly the largest participatory program on this continent. I need to acknowledge that um, this idea was not a new idea, but an idea that I borrowed from projects that I have seen in my international ag development work where participatory approaches based because of a lack of infrastructure in the, in the research system are absolutely essential. So I'm going to move quickly through the presentation because actually you heard a fabulous description of these projects from one of the previous speakers, our current NOFA representative. But I'm going to really highlight some of the, um, some of the, the important lessons learned by probably all communities and the fact that this was a very productive set of interactions. I'm going to just start by orienting you. In plant breeding, we had a paradigm. We had a model that began with the idea there was sort of an open commons um, that was freely collected and maintained in some excellent state by the government. Um, go through um, a breeding pipeline, typically still to some extent in the public sector, and then out the other end come varieties. And what it was what was clear to us by the mid-1990s, especially in vegetables and especially in regions like the Northeast U.S., where I was working at Cornell at the time, was that this pipeline paradigm is really not working very well in lots of parts of agriculture. And I've just listed a number of the characteristics, reduced public sector support, long-term Efforts like those that are the focus of this conference are very difficult to fund in three-year competitive grant cycles. Um, there was a significantly reduced ability because of consolidation in the seed industry for seed companies to deliver varieties into less lucrative markets, like vegetables in the Northeast, and um, increasing corporate control over the germplasm as well as the varieties. And so in the late 1990s, I had a large laboratory actually involved in the genetics and genomics of a number of vegetable species. But this was about the time that it became, um, I, I won't say fashionable, but it, where, where outreach was encouraged. And so in thinking about the commitments I held as a land-grant researcher, and in looking at the capacity of the system to actually deliver the benefits of my upstream research to farmers' fields, we noticed some of those gaps were, were really evident. And we invented something called the Public Seed Initiative. And this is really when Sarah and I began um, to build this, this um, structure, this set of relationships that came forward. It was a collaboration initiated in 2001 between university, government, because USDA um, scientists were involved, nonprofit organizations, seed companies, so we did have active private sector involvement, farmer breeders, and seed growers. All those different um, pieces of the seed system were involved. We simply identified simple models to get material moving better between those communities. Um, interestingly, it was funded off a large genomics grant, and, it, and this project focused on participatory trialing. I'd suggest we still have some critical needs for variety trialing, and this approach is still very relevant as sort of straightforward and simple-minded as it is. What the Public Seed Initiative allowed us to do was to discover that we actually had a lot of valuable germplasm, commercially significant germplasm, that was sitting on our university shelves because it wasn't around hard melon from California. No offense to those who grow melons in California. Um, and a good example was this beautiful melon. It's a soft orange flesh. It's an um, eastern cantaloupe type. Beautiful texture and flavor. It does not keep for six weeks. It keeps for 10 days. And, um, and as a consequence, it hadn't been picked up by the, the big vegetable companies we were working with at the time. That's little Hannah. The melon's called Hannah's Choice. Um, and it was released as a consequence simply of trialing in 2004 by one of our smaller seed companies. And this turned out to be a very important piece of the public seed initiative. We had excellent small seed companies within an hour or two drive of my university that I had never heard of. And so we made an effort to get to know 
all the small seed companies. Some of them hadn't heard of us either, or certainly didn't think we had anything for them. And it was through those types of relationships we were able to, to move some of this material. Now I'm going to tell you something. Hannah is now 20. <laughs> this took a while. And this is one of the disconnects that um, I'm confident there's still a lot of great germplasm for organic agriculture sitting right where Hannah's choice was for a long time. A number of other successful varieties um, were released through this process. I've just put another squash up there, but there were a whole array of um, varieties that came out of that process. And again, it was just a very straightforward we're trialing, but we were trialing in organic ground. Now, I learned something very important as a plant breeder. We couldn't always predict how varieties were going to perform. So one of the most important lessons I learned as a plant breeder, which I was actually taught early on, is it's really important not to assume that success in conventionally managed environments are going to predict success in organic environments or vice versa. Um, and so beyond participatory trialing, we really got interested in what it would mean to actually do selection in organically managed environments. And I have to say that my appreciation for the profound differences, biological, physical, chemical differences in organically managed environments has continued to grow through this, through my um, acquaintance and engagement in working in organic systems. We had several grants, actually there was one that preceded um, the, some of the ones you heard from our colleague at NOFA, including an, an NECR um, award that came for this, collaborative breeding for and in organic systems. So these are now participatory approaches to selection and breeding as well as trialing. So I'm not going to take the time to run through the details of each of these linkages. Suffice it to say, we blew the pipeline model away and began to say, we had a series of partners or um, different operations in this network that had to um, connect. Breeders to farmers, breeders to breeders. And this was one way we were able to engage with a number of other land grant breeders as well as breeders in private um, settings where we could move material back and forth easily and we have a great relationship with Oregon State and other um, universities as a consequence of that. So between breeders, sometimes across sectors, Breeders to trial networks. Sometimes those trial networks are maintained by seed companies. Sometimes they're maintained by public entities. And then breeder to seed company linkages. Now, you wouldn't think that is a difficult um, bridge to cross. But frequently, it is not, it's a big leap between a university breeder and a commercialized variety. We focused on networks, as I've emphasized, not a linear pipeline, but networks. And again, we recognize who's providing germplasm into this system. Well, it's germplasm banks, it's public sector plant breeders, but farmers frequently, especially organic farmers, maintain large and interesting collections. And so we honored that. We learned that material, and we learned the interests and objectives of those who held it. Um, breeders and trialers also came from all sectors. Transfers between partners were recognized as such. One of the um, real challenges in this type of participatory research when it's material of value moving back and forth is it's also intellectual property. And as much as the organic community has, um, has been alert for the issues raised by intellectual property, when it's your really cool thing that you've had on your farm for a really long time, and you understand that could be very valuable, you may not be that excited about handing it over to your neighbor who runs a seed company for no return at all. Um, and you may not be that excited about growing it commercially. There, we developed a series of very straightforward tools that partners could use to keep those relationships straight. Um, we developed the OrganicSeedPartnership.com with universities, farmers, nonprofits. And let me just mention how important, again, these nonprofit relationships have been in no small part because really effectively what the nonprofits did was substitute for an extension system that was for a number of reasons really unable to play the traditional role that extension had played. Seed companies have always been critical partners for public sector plant breeders. And we have developed, I think, a really energized community of seed companies um, accessing a lot more germplasm than they used to. Farmer breeders, we have some individuals who have taken that particular um, select interesting thing that they controlled as a farmer and have run with it themselves as a breeder selector, creating a variety, finishing a variety they may choose to hold as a distinct product from their own organization or their own farm or they may choose to um, license to a seed company just like any other breeder would. 
And then finally, I need to acknowledge a collaborator, Larry Robertson, who had um, worked internationally, was very well aware of participatory approaches and their relevance not only to breeding and selection, but also to germplasm conservation and the preservation of genetic diversity. And if there is one one um, object that I would encourage the organic community to pay attention to in federal budgets, besides research, it would be the status of funding for our germplasm banks and our collections because um, they're in desperate need of support. Very quickly, the formal objectives of a second large grant, this one exclusively focused in and for organic systems, were to provide a wide array of improved crop varieties to organic growers through seed catalogs, also nonprofit seed saving groups and other groups that distribute seed. And seed growing explicitly was, was the focus of an activity that involved a mobile seed mill, which I won't have time to tell you about, but is an interesting story. Um, we enhanced the capacity of organic growers to select and breed their own crops, should that be something of interest. Expanded a trialing and outreach network, and again, this was very heavily dependent on, on um, partners. And actually, because others were much better at classroom-based curricula, it, this element of that grant did not turn out to be a strong um, part. But one thing we did do, and this was very, very much um, a consequence of our interaction with NOFA and other nonprofits, was before we, well, before we started the proposal, during the preparation of the proposal, and in the setting of the specific objectives, we did it in a very collaborative, transparent way. And this involved the convening of several roundtables in different parts of the um, region that were served by this grant, involving growers, but also seed companies and, um, and other breeders involved. Um, we had a number of successes. I'm not going to take the time to, to tell you about um, even a few of those, but one I want to highlight um, really came out of a, another relationship with an organic farmer in Newark, New York named Liz Henderson. Um, it was on Liz's farm and a challenge that Liz gave us that um, brought my pepper breeding program into play here. Liz had a problem with a, with a disease of peppers called cucumber mosaic virus. I had been working for the California Pepper Commission for years and years on this virus. Um, but Liz said, we, we have the same virus. We have it all through the temperate zones. Can we breed an open pollinated pepper suitable for my farm, starting with that California material, and then varieties that had performed well? So this was one of our early breeding programs and in fact resulted in a publication as well as a commercial release of a variety called Peacework after Liz's farm. And, um, and so it was selected back and forth, again, very much in collaboration. Um, so Peacework is now marketed by Fedco. Some other varieties have come out of this breeding program. King Crimson is another nice variety, an early red pepper with disease resistance that performs well in organic environments and is open pollinated. Another example, I didn't even know what a white cucumber was, and I thought it was the ugliest thing I ever saw, but some people really like them. And, um, and so by interacting with some growers in Maine, we, they were these bulby yellow things, but apparently, well, they taste good, and, um, and taste does turn out to be really important. We got an heirloom and made some selections with it, Boothby's Blonde. Long story short, we won the, um, the Mailer Gardeners Association Green Thumb Award with one of the product products of this um, in 2011 with, um, with a little thing called salt and pepper on the left and another nice variety called platinum on the right, again commercially available. Um, and, and just as an aside, in all of the licensing we do from varieties out of my breeding program, we always reserve, a, the, actually we require any licensee to ensure a supply of organic seed of, everyone, of every variety. The licensee doesn't necessarily have to produce it, but the licensee has to guarantee that a sub-license will be found. Um, again, Jim had a great program in a whole set of other species. So um, on the left, you'll see one of his successes, long neck open pollinated broccoli. And he'll be available to talk more about that in the discussion section. Farmer's Daughter, another novelty type of melon, does very well in, um, in the Northeast. Um, and a strategy we've, we've used very um, consistently is to capture the very best qualities of special taste in heirlooms and put, the, put those qualities into a modern plant that yields and is disease resistant and performs in organic systems. So one of the interesting things that happened to us is we became human subjects. 
we caught the eye of a researcher in sociology at Penn State who came up to study this partnership. So we all became human subjects. She interviewed us extensively. And at the end of her dissertation, which she finished about a year and a half ago, she had some very interesting insights um, that are now beginning to show up in the sociology literature about why this project worked as well as it did. And so this is a slide that summarizes some of her observations about this. She said that we recognized and respected the needs and wants of those we intended to um, serve, and also recognized that there were cultural issues, as there always are, um, in these types of interactions. She highlighted the fact that the communities we were working with were early adopters. They tended to be very pragmatic. If we could talk about cucumbers, we didn't have to talk about a lot of other things that might be complicated where we might not agree because actually we were just talking about cucumbers. Um, we tended to be working with a very committed population of growers. And those growers tended to, tended to frame the universe in some ways that were different from the way the scientific community often framed them. But from our point of view, those, those only opened horizons. They didn't shut doors. And, um, and I have to say, I have benefited tremendously in the rest of my science life, taking some of those lessons to heart. We made an effort with the Organic Seed Partnership to reach broadly across the country in a kind of federated spoke and hub and spoke kind of system. We had a locus with Jim in the Northwest. We had a locus um, at UC Davis. We um, had great collaborators at Alcorn State and in, had the first ever field day on organic agriculture in Mississippi in January 2007. We also reached out to New Mexico State. Again, that's an area that um, has both a heavy Hispanic and, of course, a very heavy Native American presence um, with, and had a great um, interaction with the nonprofit as well as the university there. We also worked with West Virginia State. One of the most um, interesting linkages that I think some found surprising was the fact that um, we could link individual plant breeders to seed companies' organic trialing capacity. So um, this, just, this is an example of Crimson Sprinter, um, which was a selection basically made by David Padell under very stressed um, organic management regimes in eastern North Dakota. Um, it went into a trialing system that we were able to set up with this grant and came out a variety that's now marketed by Seeds of Change. So farmer breeders are then become a, a way that seed companies promote a particular variety as well. So they promote this farmer breeder as well as the variety. So very quickly to just run through outputs of this project, um, we trialed over 290 varieties. So we, we collected varieties from seed companies, public breeders, farmer breeders, um, 290 varieties and 300 breeding lines and populations were evaluated on organic farms in, um, in seven states. Seed was donated by many of the companies involved. Why? Because they got fabulous trial data. Um, and four public sector breeders, 12 grower breeders. Um, at the time this slide was prepared, we had 11 active licenses generated from this. We do segregate those licenses so that royalty revenue that is returned to the university is segregated for research in organic systems. And I should mention um, that Michael Mazurek, one of my former PhD students, is now leading this program at Cornell and he's doing a fabulous job. Again, he's collaborating with, with Jim on, an, on the next chapter of this work. Um, we had 66 outreach events just with this grant conferences with over 4,500 participants, and the OSP website continues to serve as a resource as it um, has also provided the foundation for ongoing funding. In terms of outcomes of this work, um, we recognize that we have created a network that does not go away with the funding, a series of relationships, a series of products um, and approaches that don't go away with the funding. But to the extent that they um, receive additional funding, and they have, obviously we can continue to reap the benefit. One very rich resource that is just beginning to be um, revealed is a fabulous set of surveys that our excellent partner Elizabeth Dick generated at the end of this project. And we are really interested in the fact that several social scientists have highlighted those survey results as a really interesting um, resource to move forward with. We did focus on ensuring that growers that were interested in doing plant breeding and seed production had access to um, best practices in, in those areas. Um, however, we did find also the tension that you just heard highlighted in the last session between serious 
farmers and other kinds of activities like seed production and selection. So often it was the gardeners who had time to really bear down and do some beautiful work. And so we would strongly encourage um, the full population of um, growers to be represented. And, um, and the survey indicated in general, as you heard, we had very high response rates and really high um, recognition of some of the positive aspects. Again, we enhanced capacity for growers to produce their own seed. I'm not going to have a lot of time to talk about that, but that is a really important thing for many in the organic community. Um, and, and in fact, I think began a recognition in general of the need for or, uh, land grants and other public institutions to, to ensure that, um, that communities that are not necessarily getting full um, corporate attention do get the public research. Um, when I asked the social scientist why we were successful, she said we asked and listened carefully and respectively, respectfully. We bridged a long-standing gap between land-grant institutions and the organic community, but we did not try to bridge all the various ideologies which are legion and held on all sides. And, um, and that really did give us flexibility, as did this sort of open program design. I listened to the conversation about the tension between long-term replicated research and that's suitable for publication and the kind of research that best answers immediate questions. We have found a number of ways to navigate through that tension, but there is tension there. And, um, and we did with, um, and Sarah was very helpful, as were her colleagues, in helping us set a series of tiers for growers to participate. Um, so we tried to keep things practical. Um, you will see a poster um, that Jim brought with him on the Novik project. Jim is PI on this. And again, this builds on, um, on the foundation of the Organic Seed Partnership and takes it in, in new directions. And you can talk new crops. And, and um, one important thing that we have really tried hard to do with this funding is train students and, um, and others on campus to ensure that they go on and serve the organic community. And I'll highlight two of my former PhD students who are in the audience here, Jeff Gordon and Julia Stellari, have started an entrepreneurial ag, a software startup for organic farmers. So watch for Ag Squared. They came in as molecular biologists, and they left as software entrepreneurs. So I'm going to just close by saying that the number of people and the kinds of people that contributed to this project are legion. So we prefer to attribute this to the Organic Seed Partnership, which is a collective. Obviously, that now is not sufficient because we've merged on with new projects and new grants. And um, it, it has been, uh, for I think all of us involved, not only very productive, but a very significant experience in terms of our, um, our abilities to meet some of the commitments we hold very dear as public sector researchers and to broaden our frontiers. It is um, not an exaggeration to say that the insights I gained from this kind of work were critical when I left Cornell, became dean at UW-Madison. The institution received a call for proposals from the Department of Energy to work on bioenergy. And our, what turned out to be winning proposal for what is now an award of over $140 million contained a focused research on sustainability of biofuels because I learned to think in systems from working with this community. So I want to thank you for your attention, thank USDA for the support, and thank Jim for holding up my end of the conversation from here on. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks.